Welcome, everybody. Again, this is the uh, fourth installment and the final installment of Yukon Mining's 2020 Exploration Summit. My name is Trevor Hall. Uh, once again, I am your host for today. Um, we've got uh, this is going to be a lively conversation. I'm happy to know all three gentlemen and uh, uh, have had uh, socialized events with them all. So it's going to be exciting times. And um, uh, we will pass along some important information about the projects as well. I promise it won't just be uh, four guys bantering and, and talking sports or anything like that. We will get to business right away. Uh, quick uh, mention about myself. I am the host of Mining Stock Daily. We are a daily podcast uh, that provides a news briefing out of the junior resource market every trading morning prior to market open. And uh, that's usually less than 10 minutes long, typically. And we also do some market commentary. Uh, CEO uh, corporate updates uh, with projects uh, that are happening around the world, and also um, you know just some casual analysis of what's happening with precious metals. If you have not do done so already, I uh, would humbly ask that you go to your favorite podcast network, find the Mining Stock Daily podcast, hit that subscribe button, and also um, leave a review if you like it. And if you don't, leave a review there too. All uh, constructive criticism is welcome. Uh, so let's get underway here. Uh, we have three uh, outstanding chaps that uh, I'm happy to be uh, on the panel with today. We're going to start out with Brandon McDonald from Fireweed Zinc. Fireweed trades on the TSX Venture with the symbol FWZ and also uh, on the OTC with FWEDF. Uh, Brandon, you have three minutes to... Uh, Give us a little bit of a brief overview of Fireweed Zinc. Yeah, I think a, more more than an overview, just a bit of an update to uh, what's happening this summer. So, you know, Fireweed's a zinc-led silver company with a project in Yukon, a uh, pretty big resource, one of the more substantial undeveloped zinc resources in the world. Uh, you know, the start of this year was pretty tumultuous with uh, the emergence of COVID and some pretty serious dips in the market, but it's been uh, pretty good for us. You know, when things started to come back in July, we raised uh, $5 million. And actually, just yesterday, we announced we're raising another $2 million because of some still pent-up demand. Um, so what looked like there was going to be no drill program earlier in the year has actually become a, a reasonable drill program this year. And it's mostly going to be focused on uh, the west of the property, the so-called boundary zone and some targets around that. For people who have been following the story, uh, you, you know what Boundary Zone's about for those who, who haven't been. Um, it's a, a sort of new rediscovery slash discovery in the west of our property. Big, broad, uh, low grade, but uh, it's zinc intersections, but with some very high grade you know, intermixed. Uh, the highlight last year, 230 meters true width of 4% zinc. Uh, including eight meters or including uh, 100 meters of eight percent zinc from surface, um, and then within that six meters of 42 percent zinc. So this is a very intriguing zone. So we're looking to uh, get some serious drilling done this year uh, in that area. We're going to expand the geophysics around there with gravity, uh, VTEM, mag, etc., uh, and add some geochem. So potentially some brand new targets being tested as well. So it's an exciting year for us. Uh, thanks, Brandon. Now we will turn to Matt Turner of Rockhaven Resources. They trade on the Venture Exchange with RK and also on the OTC with RKHNF. Great. Thanks, Trevor. Thanks uh, for moderating today and thanks to everyone for tuning in. I know Brandon's done a few of these. Um, Rockhaven hasn't, so just I guess a kind of a quick intro <clears throat> of our project. So we're, um, we're Rockhaven Resources. We're an advanced exploration company that's focused on a single asset. It's our Plaza project. It's a high grade gold and silver project. Um, it's about a three hour drive from Whitehorse, so road accessible. Uh, we own the project 100% and we've been working on it now for about 10 years, um, completing about 100,000 meters of drilling and a fair amount of uh, excavated trenching as well, about 24 kilometers or so. Um, we, uh, we have a nice resource. It's, uh, it's sitting at about 1.2 million ounces of gold and another 28 million ounces of silver. A uh, fair amount of lead and zinc combined at about uh, 320 million, uh, million pounds or so. Um, and 60% of those total resources are in uh, the indicated category. So um, we've got a you know, pretty high confidence 
on that resource. Um, when you put everything together and account for metallurgical recovery, you're sitting at about 1.62 million ounces of uh, gold equivalent at about five grams. So it's, um, I guess it, it really puts it at, uh, I guess the second highest grade plus one million ounce gold deposit ever discovered in the Yukon uh, next to what Grant will be talking about, the, uh, the Osiris deposit. Um, with that deposit, with that resource, we, um, in July of 2020 of this year, we wrapped an economic study around it. So an updated one, the one we did in 2016. And, um, you know, we're dealing with pretty robust uh, economics at Plaza um, at a $14.50 uh, dollar gold price and uh, and a $17 silver price. We're at uh, $378 million post-tax NPV and 37% uh, IRR. And, um, you know, I think, again, 1450 gold, if you look at uh, the plus 20% on that base case, uh, at 17, puts us at about 1740 uh, per ounce gold. We're at uh, 540 million post-tax NPV and 49% uh, and, uh, IRR. So again, you know, really, uh, really strong economics. And um, I think the big focus now in 2020 is we've, uh, over the last couple of years, we've defined some really neat targets adjacent to the deposit. Um, and so that's really kind of our focus this year is to just to step out on some of these upward targets and, you know, potentially find, you know, game changer type, uh, type, type zones that um, you know we can we can eventually turn into resources and then take the whole kit and caboodle through uh, through through pre feasibility starting next year. So we're really excited about these targets. Again, we've you know we've we've identified you know in some cases there's some anomalies that our group that's been working in the in Yukon for over 50 years they haven't seen these types of, of anomalies both uh, you know geochemically, soil geochemically, and geophysically um, in uh, you know in the 50 plus years. Uh, working in the Yukon, so that's uh, that's what we're, we're testing right now. So it's going to be, uh, I think it's going to be a fun next couple of months as we uh, as we keep the drill turning. Okay, thank you, Matt. Uh, we then turn to Graham Downs, ATEC Resources. ATEC trades on the TSX venture with ATC and also on the OTC in the U.S. with ATADF. Graham, great, thanks, Trevor, and uh, thanks everyone for for tuning in. Um, we are a primarily a gold exploration company, and we are located just northeast of uh, Victoria Gold, the producing mine and the soon-to-be uh, producing a, a Belkino Lexico uh, project. So we're just north of northeast of Kino City. Uh, we have a very large project. Uh, we began exploring that in 2006, and we discovered the Tiger Gold deposit, which is uh, about 460,000 ounces at uh, over three grams. And then uh, later on in 2008 or nine and 10, we began exploring at the Eastern end of our project and eventually uh, discovered uh, about 1.7 million ounces of gold on a maiden resource at over four grams, which is one of the highest grade open pit resources in North America, over a million ounces. So that's just a start. Um, the tiger with the Western end, it's, uh, you know, even at $400, Below the current prices has an MPV of about 160 million, IRR of 70 percent. So, and that's an oxide. So, um, and then there's uh, numerous targets along that western end, the raw trend. We're at air access right now, but um, optimistically we should get some news about uh, permit for a road to get to the western end of the project. So we're excited about that. And then uh, exploration this year, we. Uh, we're focused on the airstrip anomaly, which is again on the western end, and uh, that's a 12 square kilometer gold anomaly. And we thought it was intrusion related, but uh, it's really looking like we might have an orogenic system up there, which is which is a new development. Um, it's early days, but the quartz veining that we're seeing out there and all the indications are that it's an orogenic system. Uh, we've got previous holes, that, just rabdrill holes though, that have got. Uh, we had what was it, 13 uh, meters of a gram and a half and up to 21 meters of just under a gram. So we're pretty pumped about that. We just put two diamond drills on top of that right now. We've had a couple experts come up there and talk to us to make sure that we're on the right track. So stay tuned. we got lots of lots of fun stuff coming up. So I ask you to take a look at our website, check out the airstrip and only. That's what we're going to be doing our drilling. We'll have some news out uh, soon. Thanks, Trevor. 
Thanks, Graham. Um, for anybody listening, uh, you can and you are able to ask questions uh, to any of the uh, presenters in the uh, questions uh, chat box there on the right side of your screen. Uh, be sure to just type in your question there. Uh, and then uh, our hands behind the scenes will move those into uh, a box for us to see. And we will try to get to the questions as as many of the questions as we can within the time allotted. Uh, so again, be sure to type those questions in the chat room. Um, I have some questions for each one of you individually, but I would really like to start out with a timely discussion about the volatility in precious metals. Uh, even Brandon, you can chime in. I know you're a base metal guy. You don't know much about gold and silver, but we'll, we'll let you. We we'll have you. some silver. <laughs> oh, you have some silver. Okay, so you, you just know silver. Yeah. Uh, all right, so you, we'll let you chime in. Um, uh, today was really interesting. This morning was really interesting. We saw a big, a lot of buying coming into precious metals yesterday. Uh, we continue this consolidation after those massive moves last month. And... Um, Jerome Powell comes out and speaks, talks about uh, trying to increase inflation here in the U.S. to 2%. Uh, mm -hmm. Gold shoots up, and then as soon as he's done, gold falls back down. Um, it was, it's been a real volatile day. Do you expect to see continued volatility in the precious metals space um, as we continue to move forward until we finally maybe we get some sort of uh, you know, direction here? Whoever wants to take that first. I'll uh, I'll talk first here, guys. I, I'll go back to um, I'll go back a little bit longer term than just the last few few days or even a few months. If you go back to for us when we started looking at the economics at Klaas, I think it was in um, must have been in February, February March. You know, you look at uh, the price of silver went all the way down to eleven bucks, and we're trying to think, you know, what are we going to use for price of silver for this study? And then, you know, by the time I think we well, we picked 17 um, and from that time and it went all the way down to 11 and then all the way up from not long after when we announced the, the results up to whatever 30 bucks. Right. So it's been uh, just silver alone has just been mind boggling. And um, and yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I'd have to go back to like probably 2006 to 2009 where. I've been refreshing Kitco as much as, uh, you know, about 50 times a day or whatever, right, to see see what the new price is. So um, where it's going to go from here and how volatile, um, I, I can't really say, but uh, I've never been good at predicting where where these things are going and, and the volatility behind them. But, uh, but it's been pretty amazing to watch over the last, say, you know, five, six months, that's for sure. Graham, how about you? Can you chime in? Sure. I mean, I'm not an economist, so I, you know, I get a bit over my head on this stuff. But I mean, I just look at the big picture on, on all of this, and you know, I, th I still think even if even if they can even get to this two percent inflation, you know, you're still going to have lower interest rates for a long time. So, and then I was kind of thinking about this morning, and just looking at the global picture and the way things are happening. I mean, I think the Fed and even the Canadian government. I mean, these guys have turned on the tap for money and they've essentially just left it on and they have to walk away from it. I mean, it's going to be COVID. It's going to be a hurricane. It's going to be every year we're going to have something like this and, and we're not going to get a, get away from this. So I think we're going to be pouring money into the system. Um, and it's just, I think it's going to provide a foundation for, for gold. I mean, to me, even today, the, the a lot of this was baked in already and, 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 and it's just people trying to figure out, uh, where they want to be. I mean, all of this right now is noise. I think we're going to be in a, a solid price in the 1800, 19, maybe 2000, you know, but I, I'm happy being in an 18, 19, $2,000 gold price. I mean, we've got to remember where we're at. These are good gold prices. Companies are going to make a lot of money. And, if, and I prefer stability. The volatility is, you know, you wake up and you're like, oh my goodness. And the next day, you, you know, you're getting thrashed around here, but you know if we can just hang in here and have 18, 1900 gold for a couple of years, you're going to have a lot of companies making a lot of money, and, and the investors looking at the space in these companies, companies will make money, and and those companies are going to go out looking for for new projects because there's not very many of them. So this is a good thing for you know maybe not 
<laughs> people of Canada and North America and around the world, but it's good, it's good for the price of gold. Yeah. Uh, Brandon, can you chime in? Um, yeah. I know you uh, invest as well. It's not, you know, it's not yeah. just fireweed, but uh, you. Yeah. Um, I don't see us leaving a regime of high volatility anytime soon um, until we have clear resolution on COVID, uh, some sort of trade relation normalization. Um, there's going to be a very high degree of global economic uncertainty, which feeds uh, volatility or hyper volatility into the into the precious metals, right? And you know, per Matt's point and and Graham's point, it's like, uh, th what's your base case now? Um, you know, is it is it a two year, three year trailing, which looks really low compared to where we're at now? Um, is it the current spot? Is it the forward curve? Uh, you know, it, this this is the challenge for investors and well, even companies who are trying to model and we're, we're trying to be realistic and, you know, what do we use for our base case prices in any commodity that's seen a significant run up, right? Um, I think you'd be a little bit cheeky to use, I don't know what gold's at right now, 1980 or something like that. You'd be a little cheeky to use 1980 for your base price, but I don't think you have to use 1250, which was for the longest time, you're kind of the go-to base price too, right? And I've seen a few people you tentatively use 1450, you know, like, okay, well, let's, let's inch this up and it's like, okay, way below spot. Right. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, it, it's tough. And this is, this is an opportunity and a crisis for investors is, is playing in a, a regime of, of hyper volatility. And that's a, that's a really good point, Brandon, because I, I had a follow up question for all three of you. When you, when you move your company and your projects into a technical report, maybe it's a, anything like a resource estimate, maybe even updated resource estimate, or maybe a PEA, uh, maybe not necessarily PFS. Uh, yeah, maybe we get there. I don't know. But with this big movement in precious metals, when do you go back and decide to either update uh, a previously published technical report or when maybe you're publishing a brand new report you know what's a what is a safe base case if you have a precious metal within that uh, within the economics of your project? I mean, I mean, people used to say not too long ago if you were running fifteen hundred dollar gold when gold was literally at thirteen fifty, you were, you know, you were stretching the limits. But right now, I mean, I I don't see I don't my opinion is I don't see a whole lot of technical reports uh, that are using anything less than sixteen hundred dollar gold in their reports. I guess it depends on how near term you are, right? Because if if you're refreshing a feasibility study on a on an, a project that's operational, um, you know, you're just refreshing the economics. Well, then you can pretty much use spot because right. you're, you're literally producing, right? Um, if you're facing a uh, three to six year engineering and permitting process, and you're trying to put out a PEA now, well, spot may not be such a good metric, right? Then you have to start to look at long-term prices, which which long-term prices right now are lagging significantly spot, right? Um, you know, and it's, it's. I, I think all of us kind of nervously look to our peers and, and hope someone else blinks and, and sets resets the price. Uh, you know, we put out our PEA a couple of years ago and, and zinc was at a, over a buck 50 a pound. Um, and all these studies came out with a dollar 20, dollar 20, dollar 21, which is what we used. Um, and it was like, as soon as one person set that, we're like, okay, I guess we're going to use a dollar 20. Right. And then it mm -hmm. crashed down to 85 <laughs> this year and is now back up to a dollar 12. So well, what the hell do we know? Yeah. Graham, you published a PEA on tiger back in April. I mean, <laughs> what would have changed? What would have changed if you would have held on two months? Well, I think, you know, what, what we did there is you, you want to, in this environment, just make sure your sensitivity tables are, are appropriate. Give yourself some breathing room so that you can kind of see what's going on there. Um, we're we're kind of conservative and we're realistic. We put a lot of we, we put a lot of effort into making sure that we're not over reporting, and you know we want to be realistic about things. So, um, you know the sensitivities because and to Brandon's point, we're further further away. Um, so, um, you know, but I wish our sensitivity tables would. <laughs> a lot higher because you know then i could actually say what it is right now like ours tip topped out at 1550 we get 160 million mpv 
Well, at 2,000 gold, you know, I can't say it, but it's, it's it makes a huge difference. It's meaningful, uh, yeah. Yeah, like a real difference, especially on high grade deposits. And anyway, um, I think you just you got to be realistic. You got to do the, the appropriate trailing, and and you need to be able to stand up and defend against analysts and everybody in, in the industry what you're using. And and as long as you can stand up there and, and feel good about it, then and it should be, you'll you'll be fine. Uh, Matt, same question. You published your PEA in July. Uh, yeah. If you were looking yeah. at it today, what, how would it how would it be different? Yeah, well, at 1450, and we did, um, I don't know how many presentations to groups after that, uh, that announcement. And um, again, I can't remember what gold would have been at 1900 at the time, right after we announced it. <clears throat> but yeah, everybody was kind of like, yeah, 1450, that's totally fine. And, and like Graham said, if you have the sensitivities, and we were typically, um, we're given 15% plus or minus, but on this one, we were given 20%, which was great because it actually got us, you know, semi closer to the to what spot was at. So, um, so yeah, it's it's a it's it's a really tough call. Like I said, when we were looking at just for the silver portion of the pricing for the PEA, we started off it was I think it was at 16 bucks, and then over the course of the mining study, it went down to 11, and then you start kind of you know panicking a bit, right? Um, even though it's not a, a huge part of our economic silver, but still you start looking at the, the, the potential, um, you know, just, just the way people will, will perceive it, right? And then, again, by the time we put it out, silver was five bucks higher than what we, uh, than what we had chosen. So it's, uh, it's, it's always hard choosing the, you know, kind of looking in the crystal ball and seeing what it's, what, you know, what, what it's going to be at in two months' time, and especially lately, obviously. So... Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, like Graham said, you have the sensitivities and at least it, people can start to, you know, can look at that, right? But, but he's also right in that you can't be, you know, spouting off, you can't just type in numbers into your model and start spouting off what, what you're at at that spot just because it's, it kind of can put you offside, right? Sure. Yeah, um, and I think uh, if I can just make one small more point is, you know, the reason we only do sensitivities plus or minus 15 or 20 is because Really, if you deviate much from your base case commodity prices, you would change the mine plan. Exactly. Right? Um, yeah. You know, both Matt and Graham, if they were assuming 1900 gold, it would have been a larger, more inclusive, lower cutoff mine, right? And it's just like if we assumed higher zinc or lower zinc, it would have been a bigger mine or smaller mine, right? And and that's the challenge of like people who say, oh, well, why why don't you model this at way higher gold or why you know does this stand up you know what if your base case gold is is a thousand it's like well i'm building a different project where my base case is a thousand a lot you know smaller and higher grade you know so that's the real challenge in sensitivities is that you can't just plug a new uh you know commodity price into a spreadsheet and that's what your mind would look like you would completely model it differently right mm -hmm. um Let's move this conversation over to available capital for junior projects. I mean, we have seen just an influx of <laughs> money coming into exploration in the last couple of months ever since, you know, well, the this real rocket ship of a bull gold market has taken place. Uh, Graham, I think you raised a million dollars this summer. Matt, you raised, I believe it was $5 million. Uh, Brandon, You've raised now done, three yeah. different. I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, <laughs> can you can each of you comment just on uh, your experience with financing your your companies and your projects, and uh, why you know have you ever seen it? This uh, is is it easy to raise money? And uh, also on the side of that, what are the challenges now? I can I can go ahead. I mean, I, I haven't been as active or as Matt and Brandon, but um, you know, I was did all the financing for for the, the project back in 2009, 10, 11, and it was easy then. But um, and now I don't think it's as easy. I mean, there there is definitely more interest in, in the in the uh, industry or the sector, but um, they're being a little bit more selective, and more towards the developers still. Uh, but definitely, uh, if you want to raise some money, it's going to be a little bit easier than uh, six, eight months ago. So um, there's, there's good opportunities there right now. 
and we're we we're fortunate because we've got about ten million dollars. We we came into this season with quite a lot of money, so you know we weren't uh, looking to do a big race. Mm. Matt, yeah, it's a uh, you know definitely easier than say the last five or six years, but um, you know you still have to have a you know a really good plan going forward to show you know show people how you plan to grow or how, how you plan to advance the project. Um, I feel like it should never be just like you're, we're an exploration company. We're looking for gold. We want 10 million bucks, right? You got to have a really, a really concise plan going forward, and uh, you know, give people, uh, give investors the, you know, the, the uh, you know, the best chance, right, to 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 make a return on their investment, and a good return on their investment. So, it's um, yeah, I don't know. It's you know, it's definitely easier compared to say the last five six years. Right now, Rockhaven has I guess about seven point two million dollars or so in the treasury and we probably haven't had that much money um you know probably you'd have to go back to say 2011 right um to when we had that much that much cash so um and so i think you know being able to demonstrate to people you know how they're how we're gonna you know add value that's obviously um the biggest thing and, and that's you know that's that's one of the hardest parts in this business right is to actually go out and you know do what we're going to be doing this year or plan to do is to make new discoveries because it's uh you know for our you know for our sector the goal of what we're looking for it's it's you know it's uh two thousand dollars for a reason right it's, it's rare it's hard to find it's hard to find uh um you know big deposits and uh so that's what we're going to go and try to do so um so yeah so it's so it's yeah it's never truly easy i guess but uh definitely easier than, than over the last five, six years. Yeah. Brandon? Uh, we've done eight and a half million over three different financings this year. Um, each one taking two to four weeks to close. Uh, 2018, we had one financing, which was 12 and a half million, which took 48 hours, right? That was when it was trading really well. And, you know, in terms of... <laughs> Matt and Graham will, will certainly remember 2010, uh, in part because of their projects. Um, UConn had such a shine on it. I had a, it was with a different company. We had a little gold project in, in UConn and I went into a broker's office in Vancouver. Uh, and he said, you know, I hear your projects in UConn. I'm like, yeah. He's like, oh, we've got a million bucks for you. And that was, that was the extent of the questions, <laughs> right? Um, that was easy now that was too easy because you were getting a lot of people who just did not understand your company or project they just wanted to ride a wave and were looking for anything to to get leverage in to try to ride that wave right um although we all enjoy a certain amount when it's when it's that easy um there are consequences to that and then there was a precipitous drop you know after that so um I, I like it now, you know, if you have a good project, you can go out and you can get the money, you can find it. Um, but there's not such a, we're not so awash in capital that, um, you know, a, anybody who walks into an office is walking out with a million bucks. Yeah. Um, again, if you do have questions for any of the panelists, please type those into the chat and Bianca will uh, push those over to us and we'll try to get as many of them answered as we can. Uh, before we turn to some of those, uh, some of those questions, uh, coming back to financing because it was, it was an interesting conversation uh, the four of us kind of had before uh, we went live. But that is the case of the, the the capital available now. What is the challenge between raising the money and maybe facing a little bit dilution, knowing that? next year things might be a little bit different maybe the capital won't be available uh do you as a company are you more uh inclined to take the cash when it's readily available such as maybe we're seeing now knowing that it may be a different story next year uh, i'll just kind of chime in there i mean it, it's it's i've been it's a fine balance you know, we, we started the company in early 2000. So, you know, our company's been around you know, a long time. We've never rolled it back and we have 162 million shares outstanding. You know, we're pretty proud of that because we don't want to dilute our shareholders. So you're always in this kind of balance of, of raising money, 
trying not to dilute your shareholders to dilute in. We have a challenge of having a large project, lots of different targets. So you need to shepherd your financing and, and, and your project development in tandem. And it can be pretty challenging. So we've always liked to have money going into next year so you're never backed up against the wall. And I think and that's served us very well and our shareholders for a long time. So, you know, of course, if, if you've got a, a, a nice share price and, and you can just, that's like, like like that million dollar financing we did this year. You didn't have to have it, but we didn't have a lot of flow through. We thought we'd just top up a little. And we're going into good year. We were hoping that uh, the airstrip will be another discovery on our project. I, I'm very optimistic. It's exciting. And I would like to, of course, we all want to raise money at a higher price and minimize that dilution to protect your share. It's, it's a tough... <laughs> And it's not it's just something that you always have to be who we are yeah i think there's there's two factors at play one is dilution the other is time value of money right um mm. slowing your project down reduces the value of it because the 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 realization ultimately of those cash flows is pushed out um but speeding it up adds dilution which reduces the individual share value um, you know, I think there's the expression, the market tells you how fast to go. Um, and, I, you know, we've all seen people in this industry who just through sheer force of will have raised the money to get their project, whether whether it's engineered or permitted or whatever. Um, and it worked, but there was nothing left for shareholders because they just, they just you know, diluted the heck out of themselves. Um, so that's the challenge we had. It's like we didn't want to stop. We don't think grinding to a halt is a great idea. But at the same time, I don't, you know, I don't want to blow up my share structure. I, I will, and I'm a big shareholder, as is the rest of our management team. So um, I want those shares to be worth something at the end of the day. Um, it's, really, it's really tough in down markets to make that call. Um, but but generally, if your valuation sucks, there's probably not much capital available for you, right? Like, so <laughs> sometimes you, you can't even dilute if you want to do. All right, let, let's get to some of the questions um, uh, that were coming in through the chat. Uh, the first question is for you, Graham. Uh, it's a question in regards to uh, going back to uh, the Barrick agreement, which uh, Barrick pulled out of, uh, I believe it was last year. It seems like a while ago. Um, but how, how has the company continued to um, recover some optimism uh, with the project uh, without that big uh, joint venture? You know, it's a, it's a good point. It's a good question. You know, um, we had a great partnership with Barrick and they came in for the middle part of the, the project, not not where they are big resources out there. And uh, um, I think what happened is the baby got thrown out with the bathwater a little bit in that and thinking that we we're downgraded the project. But in fact, we actually made it better. We have a lot more information. And um, it's just right now where we're, we, it's a little bit more expensive to work out in that area. So what we're doing is we're coming back to the western end where we're gonna be closer to infrastructure. I think a key milestone for us would be when we get this road uh, permit to, to show the world that you know we you can get to our project. I think that's been one of the knocks on our project a long time. So we're excited about uh, getting that permit. That should be a big milestone for us and hopefully it'll be great. I think it will be. And then I think once we show that with the MPV of the Tiger as it currently sits and we continue to find more gold at the airstrip anomaly and prove that up, prove up this orogenic system. Um, you know, we'll be able to get back at this and, and really, um, I, I, you know, re-rate and show that we're closer to infrastructure and, and, and bring back the, the excitement in the stand. Thanks, Graham. Uh, Matt, uh, question in for you uh, regarding strategic metals. Are they still an active shareholder of Rockhaven? Yeah, they've uh, they're sitting at. I did the math this morning. They're sitting at thirty three percent. I hope I did the math right on that. <laughs> yeah, they're they're at thirty three percent right now. Um, they took uh, another what three hundred k of uh, of this uh, recent financing as well. So um, yeah, they've been phenomenal shareholders, um, really supportive, especially through the lean times, right? Um, and we were always able to, you know, on kind of the back of their investment, um, you know, whether it was solely, you know, they, they were subscribing to 100% of the raise or, or backstopping a certain, to a certain amount. 
we're always basically every year we're able to go out and uh, and do a you know a pretty sizable drill program at classes to to again keep the story going right even in the tough years. So um, so yeah, huge uh, huge credit to, to to them and and you know most of most of the the uh, the, the Yukon uh, people know Doug Eaton right and Doug Doug actually worked on Clasa back in uh, back in the 80s for Chevron. And so he's um, he always liked it, right? And, uh, and that's why um, our group was able to pick it up again. And um, yeah, he obviously still likes it because he's not only uh, through strategic and major shareholder, but uh, but personally himself too. So, and I'll just um, on that note, with, with respect to financing, um, I didn't chime in on the last comment, but uh, but I'd like to quote uh, Lou Lepre, the great Lou Lepre. Uh, you know, God rest his soul, but. Lou always uh, always commented to me, um, you know, when the cookie jar comes around, take two. And so I think, um, you know, I think that's partly what we did uh, at Rock came in here this year with the, uh, with you know, getting enough money in the bank for at least two years worth of drilling. And uh, I guess in Brandon's case, he's taken three so far, and Graham uh, Graham took one, but he's already had a bunch there, across <laughs> the way. So. Uh, so, so yeah, I would like to, to, to quote Lou on that regard because uh, it was wise words, I think. If I can uh, interject on, is it something about Graham's question? Um, you know, um, Brandon, uh, I was just going to say, sorry. you know, a, a lot of investors get concerned about when a major comes in, when they come out, when they sell. Um, you know, there's an old expression. I won't name the major that used to be in this expression, but let's just say it. There's, a, there's an old joke about if it's going to be a mine, a uh, major dropped it, um, right? And they have projects that the internal champion retires or moves or finds a new toy. And so the project doesn't have a champion internally and it gets dropped despite having incredible merits. Our project, we bought part of it off HUD Bay and part of it off tech. Uh, I assure you those were very good parts. And people ask like, you know, why did Barrick leave? Well, why did tech sell us good ground for so little, right? It, it's just the the machinery inside these things doesn't have time to, to process and maintain engagement with, with all these early stage projects. I'll add to that too, Brandon. So uh, Chevron, again, they had Plaza back in the 80s and their internal thresholds for moving a project forward was they, they needed to see at least 10 million tons of 0.1 ounce gold and um, you know they didn't see that Clasa, so they moved on. And what are we at today? 11 million tons of 0.15 ounce per ton. So there you go. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry to interrupt. So there was a question regarding uh, Yukon's experience so far with maybe Chinese investment or interest. Interest projects within the Yukon. I'll direct this to Brandon. Brandon, uh, you spent a lot of your youth in the Yukon, um, and uh, very well respected uh, <clears throat> throughout uh, the uh, McMillan Pass area. And uh, I can't remember the, the name of the town you you, you well, grew sure. up in. Yeah. There, right next to it. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Excuse me. Um, is there opportunity for? Chinese investment or maybe Chinese majors to come in and uh, take a stake in projects and uh, maybe potentially move something into development. Uh, for me, my opinion here in the United States, but given the relations that we have with China right now, that would not fly. It wouldn't happen. Would it, would it be a different story up in the Yukon? Well, it's getting harder. Um, uh, you know, the Wolverine mine was operated um, by a Chinese SOA, SOE, uh, Jindusheng Mali. Um, and um, they abandoned it effectively and, and, and sold it while it was a liability um, that, you know, did not uh, leave a good taste in the mouths of, of Yukoners. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think it's now China Copper, is it? Or is it Chinalco owns the Selwyn project in Yukon, which is a, a very large zinc project. Um, you know, it's, it's a different company but fundamentally as an SOE, it's the same beneficial owner, which is, you know, the Chinese government. Um, people wonder, is, are, are they going to behave the same way? Is, is this a potential, you know, disaster site down the way? Um, I, I don't think that you can disqualify Chinese partnerships um, 
But I think in light of the current political climate and in, in light of their past missteps in, in Yukon, I think people are going to be definitely measuring twice and cutting once there. Uh, Graham, there's a question uh, regarding your road permit expectations. Can you uh, comment on uh, any updates on that road? Yeah, you bet. So we have all of our uh, uh, our application is in, everything that uh, the Yukon government needs. Uh, we gave that to them over two months ago. Uh, they've gone past the 42 day deadline for uh, consultation, but they're working through some consultations right now with the local First Nation. There's some meetings for next two meetings next week in uh, Whitehorse and Mail. So once they conclude that and then get back to us, we should uh, be able to work through the terms of that. And then I would hope to see that permit within the next month, maybe a little bit longer there. COVID's kind of thrown a little bit of a a, a wrench in kind of community meetings and consultation meetings so um we're aware of that but uh, it's been a long road if, if pardon the pun but um we uh, hope to see it in about a month or two at, at the latest uh brandon you've had some experience with getting a road paved yeah well, not paved but just um improved you know what uh, what is fundamentally a single track road the the canal road in yukon um, the government's committed some funds to improving that and then paving the Robert Campbell, uh, which we would also use the rest of the way from Faroe to Ross River. Um, so this is important. And this is um, a key thing about Yukon and, and not just the both the Yukon Party and the current liberal um, Yukon Liberal Party government there now in conjunction with the federal government have been quite good about infrastructure investment for projects there. Um, you know, they, they know how Yukon is going to succeed. It's going to be on the back of, of uh, mining projects like these, right? So um, they're not afraid to make an investment early in the infrastructure to help these projects succeed. Yeah. How integral is it when we talk about infrastructure projects that, uh, you know, projects such as, you know, Fireweed or, or ATAC or, or even Rockhaven uh, takes a lead into pushing some of this, these development projects forward, but also knowing that you can't be the only, you know, the primary benefactor of these types of projects. Like there really needs to be um, community support and a, a, uh, a benefactor for all communities within the projects, not just uh, the gold or, or zinc or resource project. How, how important is that to move forward? I mean, I can speak from from all of the, the decade of work and consultation and work that we've been putting into this. You know, it's a single lane road to get out to our projects. It's critical. You know, we've spent over $100 million developing and, and, and exploring the, the Rack the Gold project. And uh, we spent a lot of money doing the technical, environmental studies, fisheries, water, all of these things, all of these things to get it done right. And it's got to be done right for the communities as well. It's critical. And, you know, you need to have one route and and take into it and and hear what people are saying but do something about that and that's what we've done over the years of, of trying to uh, work with this get this road permitted so and yeah the benefits have to come around and there's there are a lot of opportunities uh to give back with these projects so infrastructure is absolutely critical uh, for the for the for the yukon and it's in, it's critical for the yukon to support these things as well Matt, do you have any comments? We got five minutes left. Yeah, yeah. The um, you know there was a mine going out in our neck of the woods up until 1999, and so um, when you look at it specifically at the village of Carmax, where we're located, uh, you know nearby to um, you know most people remember what it was like to have the you know have the high paying jobs, have the you know driving around the new trucks and all that, right? So um, and I think that's you know it's partly why there is. Again, Brandon kind of alluded to it, where it's you know kind of the, the lifeblood of the Yukon, right? Is mining, and um, when you know something that's still so you know prevalent in people's memory um, of what you know how uh, how uh, beneficial it can be to have a mine nearby. Um, yeah, that that really resonate resonates in all you know discussions with uh, with First Nations, with uh, you know on community consultation visits with with the townspeople. Um, it's uh you know it's huge so and the government knows it town people know it first nations know it um but again like like green said it's all got to be done right and um 
you know, specifically for, for say, road construction in his case, but like for us, there's already a road and there's, you know, it's, it's not just, it would not just be for us. It's a, it's a multi, uh, multi-user route. There's, um, you know, they're doing reclamation on the old mine. There's 12 active plaster mining operations during the summer months. Um, and then, you know, people come out to, you know, pick berries and stuff like that. So there's a lot of people using that route. So, um, you know, making it, uh, making it as good of a route, route as possible um, is, uh, is enormous. And, you know, because there's the old mine nearby and, and it wasn't that long ago when it was, when it was running, the, the, the road itself is, 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 itself is quite good. So, um, so really there's not too, too much that needs to be done for upgrading, but, you know, any sort of upgrading is always good. Well, if I may say from experience, the next time I'm up in the Yukon, I'm getting a dirt bike or a razor or something. I'm taking that road to Klaza because not only is it excellent for that type of recreation, but it is just breathtaking. It is beautiful. Yeah. All these projects uh, are beautiful. For sure, yeah. At Klaza, you're up above tree line, so it's um, it's pretty uh, it's pretty spectacular. And it's uh, yeah, you're always welcome, Trevor. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, okay, so we just got a couple more minutes left, and then we gotta get these get this wrapped up. Uh, and then I've, I've, I think I've asked every panel that it's timely conversation uh, due to COVID. What is the hiring? Uh, cha- is there any hiring challenges for either of you uh, based on what's happening uh, with the pandemic? Um, is it an issue? Is it not an issue? And how are you keeping your people safe? Jeez, you could talk about that for quite some time. Uh, <laughs> we have, we have you a got two minutes. Big manual on it. You know, uh, the key thing for Yukon companies is that there's only really free movement of people without quarantine between Yukon and BC. Um, so if you had critical contractors and personnel who might have otherwise been coming from Alberta or Ontario, then, then you got to find someone new. Um, so, you know, for us, fortunately we didn't, but, um, you know, we pay a lot of attention to social distancing in camp, uh, cleanliness, hygiene, taking, taking people's temperature every day. Um, anyone with symptoms gets sent out and gets tested. Um, it's, it, it's a lot, but it's, it's necessary. So, um, mm-hmm. I think most companies seem to be doing it right. So hopefully we, we escape this year, uh, without an incident in a camp. Yeah, health, health and safety is always a primary concern, but this just brings on a, you know, a whole other element to it. And um, you know, we've got pretty strict protocols at Plaza. Um, you know, including the, you know, we have more, our geo came in from BC about uh, I guess about four weeks ago, and we uh, we self quarantined them just to be on the safe side for 14 days in Whitehorse. Um, so you know, trying to. Uh, trying to our best to take no chances, right? And especially for our project, we, we hire a lot of uh, people from, from the local town of CarMax. And um, it's, uh, you know, we, we're, just, we're just being really, really uh, careful this year. But uh, so far, so good, so. All right, Graham? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, you know, we've made arrangements that f- for us. Uh, we have small crews, most of them are from, from the Yukon and, uh, I think for us, we have like, for example, I was up there a week and a half ago, you know, because we came in as a little pod. We ate separately from all of the, all the other team members. We self, you know, wherever we could, we tried to keep our, our pod, our masks, plane, the helicopter, um, you know, so, and we, we route around mail. We do not want to do, have anybody go in through mail, the community, you know, the First Nation and the, the communities are paramount to make sure that they're safe. And uh, yeah, strict strict guidelines and just minimize getting out there. And if you don't have to, then don't do it. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Graham, Matt, thank Brandon. You. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm sure if anybody's out there has any follow-up questions for either of these gentlemen, they can reach out. Uh, you can find their contacts on their website or any press release. Uh, shoot them an email, give them a call. They're, they will always answer your questions. I know because I call them far too often. Um, but I think uh, it is appropriate that we leave you all with uh, what our good friend Ann Turner just said is the quote of the day. 
When the cookie jar comes around, take two. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. That concludes this month's 2020 Exploration Summit. Uh, thank you uh, to the Yukon Mining Alliance uh, for helping set this up. Thank you to everybody at SIX. Uh, Jane, Bianca, for helping set up the technical stuff. You all did an excellent job. Thank you for making it easy for me every week. And thank you for all of our panelists who have joined us. And thank you so much to everybody who uh, joined in as an attendee. Uh, it means the world to all of us. And uh, great things are happening in the Yukon. I love that jurisdiction. It, I look forward to going back and seeing my friends and seeing the advancements in some of these projects. So that's it from us. Have a wonderful rest of the week. Take care, everybody. Be well. <laughs>